I invite you now to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and salvation. Amen. I don't know, maybe it's because I grew up in the area of the country known as the Great American Desert. I don't know, but I have a fondness for deserts. Whereas the lack of uh, trees and the sprawling and immensity of the desert can be overwhelming and uninspiring to some, there is something that attracts me to it. You know, its beauty doesn't immediately jump out at you like the Cascade Mountains or the Redwood Forest. You know, it doesn't have that. It requires, the desert requires focus and concentration. You have to think about what you're looking at and what's out there before you ever see the deer and the antelope play. There's something in the desert that is subtly amazing, silently unnerving, mysterious, and ultimately foreign to what we know and seek and experience in our society, in our world. We, we want things around that move quick, we grab and uh, uh, head on out, you know? Unlike good art that takes time to gaze at and then reflect upon. This really came into focus for me a few years back when Jean and I did a nighttime climb that started at midnight up Mount Sinai. And as we went up those thousands of feet, there were no city lights. There were just the celestial stars. There were no sounds except that of God's creation. There was no useless, senseless chatter, just alone time to ponder, think, and dream and confront your past. There were dangers, twists and turns, hidden cliffs that were uh, kind of engulfed in the darkness enshrouded drop-offs, but nothing there that I you know, passed by or entered into distracted me from the sacred potential of just experience, experiencing the quiet, isolated, separated, sacred time of the climb. But unfortunately, this wasn't everyone's experience. You know, there were some who were very annoyed by how it transpired. They didn't like the lumbering ride and the repeated kind of snorting of the camels. They weren't comfortable with the dusty darkness and the younger ones um, were not so much about the disconnect from the internet. Now, these were all realities for sure, but none of which I could personally relate to. But then maybe that's where the tension lies. Maybe that's why we struggle with the Bible and its stories and we don't get it. Because within the scriptures, there is repeatedly this setting of a desert, the people of God in these away places. And our world, our society, our urbane culture, or maybe I should say urban, that's the world we've created and have become used to. You know, for 40 years, the desert was the unsettled home of the freed but wandering Hebrew slaves. It was the place where God chose to give them the Ten Commandments, the law around which they could build community and hold themselves together as a nation. It was the reclusive, regenerative refuge for Elijah, Ezekiel, even the politician King David, and in our scripture today, Jesus. Which doesn't mean that it's more important than, you know, those wonderful images we have, like in the 23rd Psalms of green pastures and running streams or Genesis and this earthly Eden. But the desert is where God's people Spiritual prophets and leaders often find themselves because the world is too much. The world uh, pours too much upon them. And it's not that there aren't times, days, years when everything feels, you know, just right, perfect, in sync. But for those people who follow God, there is always a dis-ease, even in the best of times, because we are, they are seeking to be more. 
They are seeking, searching, struggling for that vision of Jerusalem, which in Hebrew, Yehu Shalom, means God visions of peace, which we know it isn't, yet we strive for that ideal. We know that Yehu Shalom, the vision of lights being open on 24 hours a day and the doors to the city open seven days a week where love overflows and welcomes the stranger. We know that's the place that, you know, we claim we are, but we have to ask, is it? Or is it a fake ideal? You know, to become a people, Exodus, the book of Exodus tells us that a whole generation, an entire generation of formerly enslaved Hebrews had to pass away. They had to die away before the people, the younger folk, could move on. The Hebrews needed to cease fighting among themselves, bickering, pointing fingers before they could step as a new people and united people into God's promised land. In the past, slavery was the only thing they had in common. You know, uh, in Egypt, their heritage was slavery because they were as disparate as the stars of the skies coming from all over the known world at that time. They were not one people except in slavery. And becoming one people, even though they were free, a people with a shared identity required a lot of work and dealing with disagreements and struggles. You know, their favorite cry was, take us back to Egypt, take us back to Egypt, they shouted at Moses. And then they complained about the manna and the food God provided. Take us back to Egypt, at least there we understood our place, we knew our role in society, and we never had to make decisions for ourselves. Our masters, our taskmasters did that. And in our gospel, after his baptism, we are told that the Spirit pushes Jesus into the desert before he can initiate and begin his ministry. And there he too faced the distractions of self-interest, factioning, and power, those things that always stand in our human way. <coughs> and, and so we ask, or at least I do, what do these two have in common? What does Jesus' time in the desert have in common with the freed slaves of Egypt? Well, the link is time in the desert. That setting where they are on their own. You gotta know who you are to stand firm on your own. In the desert, there is nothing to dissuade, distract, or disguise what's happening around you, within you, ahead of you. You are alone, you have to figure it out. And that's quite the opposite of the way most of us would want to exist in the world we've created. So the Hebrews and Jesus were forced to step out and step back in order to see things as they really are, to, to really solidify who they were, because the going only gets tougher as you leave the desert and move back into the world. You know, this past week I was, like probably many of you, I was shocked and appalled by the events that took place on Capitol Hill. Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined living to see the day when rioters stormed and looted and desecrated the Capitol. Yet I shouldn't have been surprised because as I've read and studied and observed, I have thought for years, if not decades, that our country has been moving into a desert we too, like those Hebrews, have been fighting, bickering, factioning, wanting not just our say, but our way. And like Jesus, we confront those, temple, uh, those temptations that the evil one places before us of ultimate power and say and being somebody. Take us back, Moses. Take us back to where roles were clear and things were simple. 
And so it's been, in my mind, a ticking bomb waiting to explode, it, explode, and it finally did. So like the wandering Hebrews, interpreting freedom as the ultimate outcome of individualism, we have subtracted unity from the occasion from the equation of being one. We have relished the notion of not having a master, but we have disregarded the work, responsibility, and accountability entailed in being honest, fair, and just masters of ourselves. You know, when things are best, it's an old Baptist saying, when things are best is when the devil tries hardest. And like Jesus, in these times, we have experienced those same evils that sought to seduce him and attack the human Achilles heel of power, possessions, and self-manifestation, self-idolatry. In the wake of what's happened, I have heard from many leaders on television and politicians who reply to, how did this happen? Uh, they have no answer. I give them credit for trying to cool the flames of the fire by appealing to a higher ideal, an idealistic image of ourselves by saying, you know, friends, this is not who we are. As though that call to rise up is going to fix things. It won't. Because they say this is not who we are, but reg regrettably, it is. It is who we have become, who we have allowed ourselves to become. And it can't be fixed until we admit that we are or have become our own enslavers, locked down with ideals that are merely a veneer, a selfie of false design, a desert of our own creation, where we are chained and bound with fetters that we have forged ourselves with anger, hostility, ugliness, nihilism, defended and accepted. Defending and accepting these things, uh, we don't want to let go of them. We are afraid what might happen if we do. And we forget that in all of these instances, God promises that if you let go and trust me and follow, there is a better, brighter promised land ahead. Do you remember what our parents uh, tried to teach us when we fought with siblings or our neighborhood kids? You know, they took us by the, they grabbed us by the ear and took us one by one together and they said, now say you're sorry, shake hands. When some instances kiss and make up. We did what we had to do to get out of that situation, but I didn't like it. And, you know, I would prepare for the next time. I'd be ready next time. I'd be ready next time. I think we're still doing that or thinking that way today. You know, that's why we have uh, every sporting event has a referee. Because the referee stops problems or penalties early in the game because we all know they grow out of hand, uncontrollable, if it isn't done early. You know, if individuals from another country had attacked our capital, they don't have to represent it in another country, they just have to look like people from another country, there would have been a unanimous declaration of war as happened with the Twin Towers. But instead, we're hearing shouts of patriotism and attaboy. And I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't get that. I just can't understand. Friends, let's admit we are in a time of the desert. You know, it's clear. It's clear. The only question is whether we are at the beginning of our journey in the desert or the end. And that outcome is up to us. We need not wander, but we can choose to. 
I have come in my 65 years of life now, I've come to the realization that life holds two types of pain. The first is a disability, uh, disabling kind of pain. You know, we experience this when we break a bone or uh, we have an appendicitis and the appendix needs to be removed, that we know that kind of pain, it's a suffering pain. But the second pain, which is very real also, the second pain is different because, and it's still pain, but it is a healing pain. It's a healing pain. And it is achieved by fixing the problem, removing the problem, setting the problem, and then entering into rehabilitation. What's wrong has been made right to the best, best of the physician's ability. And we know rehabilitation isn't quick or easy, and it usually is accompanied by discomfort and pain. And just because we remove an appendix, we can't remove the scar. It's always a scar. And I'm told that scar tissue is actually stronger than the natural, normal, previous tissue. And the scar tissue remains forever, and that's a good thing in many respect, respects because it reminds us continually that something went wrong and needed to be fixed. And then, in addition, we know that as we leave a hospital or the doctor's office, they give us a prescription or instructions for the time ahead that we might get better, we might heal and get back to life. The, instruction, the instructions provided to us by our great physician, they stand firm and had for centuries and generations around the world. Jesus' prescription, a reminder was, in this world you have trials and tribulations, times when you will be in the desert. It can't always be easy or simple. You aren't simple-minded people. Living in freedom and peace is difficult and challenging. But you need not go round and round and round in circles when you enter those times. They do not spell the end, but in many ways, they are a wake-up call for a new beginning. Lincoln once said, I've always sought to plant a rose where I found a thistle. So be of good cheer, Jesus concludes, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world in its darkest nights, its most discouraging and painful days. I too have been in the desert. Take heart, I emerged better, prepared for the work ahead. Keep the faith, stay strong, and we will too. Amen.